George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel was born in Stuttgart in 1770 and was part of a generation of genius in Germany that included Beethoven and Goethe. He was a contemporary of the German idealist philosophers Johann Gottlieb Fichte and Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph von Schelling. Hegel's mission was to create a single system of philosophy that made sense of the whole of reality, a unified theory of everything. Getting into Hegel is difficult precisely because of his genius. His central claim is that the true is the whole. He's a holist, and he believes that no parts can be understood in isolation from the whole to which they belong. And his own philosophical system is a wonderful <laughs> example uh, precisely of that. He's developed it in such a way that all of the parts hang together and uh, relate to one another. And it's, uh, you know, any place you reach in and pull out a string, uh, you're into the thing. But there's a sense in which uh, until you see the whole picture, you can't fully understand uh, any of the parts. And it's a big picture. <laughs> In many respects, Hegel's thought was a continuation of the German idealists whose work preceded his, notably Schelling and Fichte, who themselves were reacting to Immanuel Kant's revolutionary reformulation of philosophy. Kant's legacy was monumental and included the notion that our minds are explicitly designed to enable us to understand the world of experience. What lay beyond the world of experience was, by definition, unknowable by the categories of the mind, a realm which Kant termed the noumenal. What could be known through the senses he called the phenomenal. We never experience the noumenal realm, because the categories of the mind apply only to the phenomenal, not to the world in itself. The German idealists argued that if we know that the noumenal exists, then we, in fact, do have knowledge about what Kant deemed unknowable. Specifically, that it does indeed exist. Furthermore, how could a thing in itself cause our sensations, as Kant believed, without giving us any knowledge of the noumenal realm. These objections led the idealists to the position that whatever is, is knowable. Following this analysis, Hegel believed that reality is rationality, that our minds and the objects we interact with every day are expressions of the same logos or principle of intelligibility. For example, when we look at a pencil, what we are seeing is the collection of our ideas about that pencil. It is yellow, long, sharp, and so on. These characteristics, called universals, don't exist independently of the pencil. Their being is in the pencil. The pencil is what we know of it, nothing more. Broadening the scope of this analysis, Hegel believed that the world as a whole is the product of an absolute mind. The absolute, known from a theological perspective as God, is disclosed in nature and in thought. Everything that happens in the world is a progressive self-unfolding of the Absolute, what Hegel called the idea. The idea is developed, objectified in the world, and then returns to itself as it's being understood through human history. Put another way, the universe comes to self-consciousness in human thought. To recognize reason as the rose in the cross of the present and to find a delight in it 
is a rational insight which implies reconciliation with reality. Like nature and human thought, the absolute is a dynamic process of unfolding that follows a logical structure known as the dialectic. The dialectic follows the mind's natural inclination to move from the general to the specific. In some instances, the first moment can be described as a thesis, whose contradiction is an antithesis. The third moment is the synthesis, in which the idea and its contradiction are brought together into a new thesis, starting the process anew. Hegel's first dialectic was that of being, nothing, and becoming. Hegel called being the original featurelessness which precedes all definite character and is the very first of all. The natural antithesis of being is, of course, nothing, the negation of being. The third movement in the dialectic is becoming, the synthesis of being and nothing. Something can be and not be at the same time, only by becoming. Moving methodically forward in this way, Hegel applied the logic of the dialectic to much of human culture including art, religion, philosophy, ethics, and politics. He conceived of history itself as an ongoing process of the unfolding dialectic, the ultimate outcome of which is freedom. The Hegelian system suggests an intimate identity between the absolute and the human spirit. But the balance between the two terms of this equation is unstable, leading to deep divisions among those who would follow in Hegel's footsteps. For some, the task of philosophy was to understand man as a divine manifestation, for others, to understand God as a human production. In Hegelian philosophy, everything is connected eventually and the idea as the absolute. It is a great reconciling synthesis, one which Marx, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, and others would react to in very different ways. And Hegel is always making the claim that ph philosophy uh, must be and can be knowledge in the strongest sense of the term. That implies that um, you have to get the totality, you have to get the completeness, you have to get to the end. And it seems to me that, that this is Hegel's most vulnerable point. Because as soon as he says, this is the totality, someone's going to come along and say, but you left this out. Um, and he will respond, well, I, I mentioned something about that along the way. Um, and then the response will be, but uh, the way in which you mentioned it, you subordinated it to uh, a horizon in which it wasn't allowed to be itself. So Marx will say that about economic life, and Kierkegaard will say that about religious life. Karl Marx began his training in the law, but switched to philosophy, which he studied at the University of Berlin. There, he was exposed to Hegel's idealism and his dynamic view of history. Marx was attracted to Hegel's notion that history is an unfolding process of moving towards a state of freedom. However, Marx came to believe that man is the true subject of reality, not Hegel's abstract idea. Hegel had stated the real was rational, that the essence of man was found in philosophy, in the arts, in spiritual life. For Marx, the widespread oppression of industrial workers contradicted this notion, 
The laboring class of industrial workers, or proletariat, lives under the constant stress of acquiring the basic necessities to sustain life and is cut out of the sphere of culture. For Marx, Hegel's system is only fulfilled at the level of abstract thought. Hegelian rationality was cancelled out by poverty and repression. People took issue with Hegel at first primarily by saying, hey, you left this out. And so Marx says, uh, you left out the poor. And, and the workers. Oh, you mentioned them in a paragraph of the philosophy of right. You called attention to the fact that capitalism cannot solve the problem of poverty. And then you just went on as if nothing had happened. Um, but for people living in the real world, the fact that there is this poverty and this suffering um, is something that tells us that the world is not a rational place. <laughs> Marx believed that the dialectic of history is a process that can't be stopped, only guided. Accordingly, the task of philosophy is not to interpret the world, but rather to steer the inevitable process of transformation. His is a rigorous and muscular conception of philosophy as an engine of change and reformation that is fully engaged in the lives of real people. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Marx became politically active, publishing radical journals, helping to organize workers, and writing the Manifesto of the Communist Party for the fledgling Communist League. He settled in London, and living with his family in deep poverty, would go to the British Museum's reading room and work from nine in the morning until seven at night. Here he produced many of his most important works, including Das Kapital. In his writings, he defined man as the entity which is produced through work. The proletariat is alienated from its own essence because work is deprived of all meaning other than as a way of satisfying basic necessities. And workers are alienated from the results of their labor, which belongs to the capitalist. Religion also produces alienation in the proletariat. Influenced by the work of Ludwig Feuerbach, a severe critic of religion, Marx believed that what people call God is nothing more than a projection of the ideal human. The person who can't fulfill his essence in the real world achieves it in the great beyond, and this fantasy lets him bear the misery of his daily life. Marx called religion the opiate of the people because it lulls workers into a passive, forgetful stupor. Hegel's philosophy viewed history as the development of ideas quite apart from their socio-economic context. Marx rejected Hegel's idealism in favor of dialectical materialism, what he called the economic law of motion of modern society. Its evolution is visible in the five epochs of history. The primitive communal, slave, feudal, capitalist, and, projecting into the future, the socialist and communist eras. By mapping out the development of social classes against evolving means of production, Marx believed he could predict the end of history the point at which all strife ended and the dialectic of history came to rest in communism. While Marx labored to move the focus from Hegel's idea to the plight of the worker, 
Soren Kierkegaard strove to dethrone Hegelian abstractions and exalt instead the lone individual standing before God. <laughs>